So good evening um, and welcome to the first lecture in our IBC and Commerce Bank keynote speaker series for 2022 and 2023. I'm George Clark. I'm the director of the Center for, Stud for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade in TAMIU's A.R. Sanchez School of Business. Our center, together with IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, brings speakers to talk about topics in the areas of international trade, economics, finance, demography, and immigration. And so um, we've, got, we've got an excellent speaker on immigration today. Um, before introducing our, our speaker, I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting the event. So IBC um, Bank and Commerce Bank. With their support, we've been able to bring many thought-provoking speakers over the years to TAMIU and to Laredo. So thank you very much. Also, for the students here, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so at the end of Dr. Arrhenius' presentation, there'll be a question and answer session. Um, we'll take questions from the audience in attendance here today. So if you have a question, just stick up your hand, and one of our student volunteers will bring you a microphone, and you can, and, and, and you can ask your question. It's good to wait for the microphone, because it can be difficult to hear you if, we don't, if, we don't, um, if, you don't, if you're not speaking into a microphone. So please wait to, to, for a microphone to ask your questions. If you're online, which there's many, many of, which many, many people are, um, then you can, um, you can ask questions through the chat feature. And what we'll do is um, I will read out those questions as they, as, as the, as they come up in between the, 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 the in-person um, questions. And we'll try to address as many questions as we can for our allotted time. If you're a student here and you're attending for a class, um, you should have had your student ID scanned at the door. Um, in addition, you're provided with a QR code, and um, which will take you to an online form to fill out. And in that, you want to put in the names of your class um, information, name of your professor, so that you can get anything they promise you to uh, for, 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 for coming. Um, finally, you'll, you'll scan your ID when departing once the lecture has ended. Um, for students attending online, your class information should have been submitted during the registration process for online. So um, with, with the housekeeping done, I want to introduce our speaker. So today's speaker is Dr. Pia Arrhenius. Um, Dr. Arrhenius is a vice president and senior economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She's a labor economist who works on regional economic growth and demographic change. Um, she manages the regional and microeconomics group in the Dallas Fed. She's an executive editor of Southwest Economy. She's going to become the president of the Southern Economic Association, which I just found out today, um, um, starting, off, um, starting next month. And she's authored many academic articles and has edited um, and co-authored several, co several books. In 2004-2005, she worked as a senior economist on the Council of Economic Advisors in Washington, D.C. for President Bush. Um, she has a PhD in economics from UCLA and bachelor's degrees in economics and Spanish from the University of Illinois. So we're very pleased to have her here today to kick off our 2022-2023 IBC Commerce Bank Keynote Speaker Series, and she'll be presenting how closing the borders heated up the U.S. labor market. So let's welcome her to Tammy Yu and to Laredo. <laughs> thank you, George. Well, thank you so much. Uh, just start with my appreciation for being invited uh, back to Tammy Yu and back to Laredo. Uh, just really appreciate it. And it's an honor to be part of the speaker series, which is um, just a wonderful group of scholars that are invited in. And so I'm I'm honored, really, to join their ranks. Uh, and also my personal thanks to Doc, uh, Professor Clark, who uh, has been hosting me. And uh, we've been touring the museums. And, uh, and uh, I just love, I love Laredo. And, and he took me for Mexican food for lunch. So I'm very happy today. So, so thank you. Um, so I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to see students. I think one, one drawback of being at the Federal Reserve versus a university is I don't get to see enough students. So I'm happy to see you and I'll, t I'll take time to maybe point out some things as we go along that you might be interested in, especially since uh, from a student perspective. But so what I've been uh, normally, you know, normally I do work on immigration as, as Professor Clark was was pointing out, but it's been pretty rare that sort of my my research field intersects with sort of the central bank and monetary policy. Obviously, I work at the central bank, 
but I'm a labor economist. I'm on the regional team. I mostly work on, on, on uh, Texas and Mexico. Uh, and I'm not always front and center in the monetary policy sort of uh, debate or discussion, as you will. Uh, of course, I follow it along. But uh, it just so happened that in this pandemic, sort of my main research interest, which is immigration, ran straight into uh, monetary policy. Uh, and I think it took us a while to realize it, but that, that's really what I'm going to walk you through today, is really how we came to realize uh, in the pandemic how important immigration is, not just to economic growth, but to the robust functioning of the labor market in general. So, uh, so let's get started. Um, let me take you through a roadmap. Um, so we'll start with immigration ground to halt in 2020. It essentially fell uh, to zero, essentially zero which is shocking uh, for the US because we normally are net inflow. So, so immigration minus out migration in any given year is usually between 800 and 900,000 people uh, uh, in any given year. So, uh, so for that to go to essentially zero, which is what happened in 2020, was, uh, it's just unprecedented. Um, and why did that happen? Because we closed the borders in the pandemic. And they were closed here, they were closed all across the world. Most countries closed their borders. And then if they didn't outright close their borders, well, they uh, implemented such health, stringent health uh, policies that you couldn't cross the borders. They closed the consulates. Uh, you couldn't process a visa. Uh, so there was a number of changes um, that occurred that really made, um, completely uh, made immigration dry up. Um, but when I show you the immigration trends, which we're going to go through together, you're going to see that actually immigration was dropping even before the pandemic. So even coming into the pandemic, we have what we called tight labor markets, or we had diminished flows of immigrants into our country. And one possible reason is there were uh, deliberate efforts to slow immigration um, uh, by the federal government uh, in the years prior, really from 2016 to 2020. And I think that really seems to have had an effect on the size of the flows prior to the pandemic. So once the pandemic hits, uh, we already have labor scarcity. And that's just going to be aggravated then when flows completely dry up. So why does this matter? I'm alluding to it here. It matters because, well, if the pandemic recession would have lasted all of 2020, it wouldn't have mattered maybe, but the pandemic recession basically only lasted two months. <laughs> so after two months, the economy began growing again. Obviously, there were still millions of unemployed. Just in Texas alone, we lost 1.4 million jobs in two months. It was, it was devastating. But after that, as early as June 2020, we began to grow again, and we grew quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker. And so economic recovery really took off. Um, and of course, employers needed to hire. They were getting the PPP payments from the government. Um, and so they were able to keep their people. And when demand picked back up, they wanted to hire. And there were, they tell us, no workers. So. Um, so when there's no workers, we have to go back and we have to look at the labor force and we can look and see what is the contribution of immigrants to the labor force? What role are they even playing in the labor market? And I think, you know, if you haven't heard this before, then you'll be probably surprised when I tell you what share immigration is of labor force growth. And we'll talk about that here shortly. So then as a result, the economic recovery takes off and there are no workers. <laughs> Uh, labor market tightens. Now, what does that mean? If you're in your economics class, I don't know if you're taking macro or reading the newspaper on your phone. Um, typically, when we talk about labor market tightness, we're usually talking about low unemployment rates um, or a, a sort of a high vacancy rate, like job postings, very high job number of job postings per worker looking for, for work. Um, and then a consequence of a lot of job openings and few workers to fill them is that uh, wages have to go up to accommodate that, right? If you have uh, uh, growing demand for workers and shrinking supply of workers, um, then obviously um, the wage has to adjust to bring those workers back into the labor market. So we've been seeing significant wage growth and inflation because wage growth does feed into inflation. And that's sort of the big crossroads where the Federal Reserve is now. The central bank is trying to 
uh, temper inflation. Um, and so we can certainly talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, and then the last thing I'll cover in this presentation is, well, I was hopeful looking at everything that happened in the pandemic. You know, we didn't have any immigrants and then the sort of the, the labor market ground to halt and then we had, you know, um, all this dislocation and, and, and difficulty hiring and so forth. And so I thought, well, will this experience change anyone's mind about immigration? So we'll look at some opinion polls uh, and then we'll conclude. All right, so, um, so here's net migration that I kind of walked you through here earlier. So, so net migration, I think this starts in the early 90s and this is sort of the net number of people that come into the country every year. Um, it doesn't include the short stays like tourists or anything like that, but people who come um, to live in the US for at least a year. Um, and so, like I said, it's you know between usually 800,000 and a million, uh, at least prior to 2016. And you can see sort of that peak in 2016, and then you can see that big decline in net immigration into the United States long before the pandemic ever struck. The other thing I included on this chart is recession bars. And the recession bars are there to tell you that in the United States, because immigration is tied to the economy, we see more in good years, good economic years, high growth years, and we see fewer or less immigration in, in recessions. And so you can see, for example, in the Great Recession, 2007 to 2009, there was, uh, you know, there was a decline in immigration. Um, and the earlier recession, the high-tech bust, there was a decline in immigration. Um, but of course, in 2016, you can see 2016 to 2020 that there was something else going on. And that's when I talked to you a little bit about the different policies that were implemented um, during that time that probably um, contributed to that decline in immigration. Um, but anyway, so yeah, coming into 2020, where there's also a very tiny, narrow recession bar, those are our two months of pandemic recession, um, that uh, you know led to basically that blue line going all the way to essentially zero in 2020. There's been a little bit of a rebound uh, in 2021 with uh, you know a number of about 240,000, um, but again nowhere near where we usually are. Um, so what happened to labor force? So this is the year-on-year -year change in the U.S. labor force, and you can see uh, it turned sharply negative in the pandemic. And so those are job losses, and those are people leaving their, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, furloughed or, or, or leaving their jobs on their own accord. Uh, and so you just see a very steep decline uh, in the labor force, a decline of 1.7% in 2020, and then a very small, uh, modest rebound in 2021. Um, where did the workers go? Well, when they closed schools, it was kind of, you know, if you have kids, kind of hard to go to work if you have nowhere to put your kids. Uh, so if you can't work from home, you know, you maybe have to quit your job. And so obviously there was a lot of stimulus programs and a lot of safety net programs rolled out during the pandemic to help cushion people um, so that they could, you know, take leave from work or so that they could sort of pay their bills while they were being furloughed as you know, there were lockdowns and closures of restaurants and so forth. Um, and so people used the safety net, whether it was uh, generous unemployment benefits or the stimulus checks and for businesses, as I mentioned, the PPP program, um, that sort of facilitated adjusting uh, to, this, to this decline uh, in the economy. The problem was that this also probably delayed people coming back. Um, into the labor force once uh, the economy started growing again, which happened, as I said earlier, very quickly. So, so where are immigrants in this picture? So let me show you. Um, so here I'm separating that labor force growth into native workers. So those are just the ones who are born in the U.S. Uh, and foreign-born workers uh, in red. And you can see that um, the decline uh, – well, you can see many things that are interesting on this chart, but the decline in the foreign-born uh, – labor force was much steeper uh, in 2020 than it was uh, for the native uh, labor force. And so that's, that's the immigration drying up. That labor force, a lot of the growth in the foreign-born labor force is the inflows of immigrants every year. So if they stop coming, that population is going to stop growing and it's not going to contribute to labor force growth. 
so then we saw also a healthy rebound of that foreign-born labor force growth in 2021, but we did not see any rebound or uh, it, the blue line is still in negative territory for 2021, which means that the native labor force continued to shrink in 2021. So in 2021, it was uh, the immigrants really that helped uh, spur the, the growth in the labor force because uh, natives were still detracting from it. So that leads us to the next question. How much, uh, what share of growth is made up by the foreign born? So how important are immigrants to growth? I mean, we show you these year on year changes, but that doesn't tell you like the volume. It doesn't tell you how many there are, or how important they are in terms of the size of their contribution. So here I'm plotting um, just in raw numbers, the change in the labor force, again, for natives and immigrants. And so they're not that different. So we're talking, if you go and do the math here, on average, immigrants are about 45% of uh, labor force growth. So if you think the labor force grows on average about uh, half a percent a year, uh, then almost, so that should be about 800, about a little over 800,000 workers, right? And, um, yeah, one half percent is about over 800,000 workers and about half of that. So about 400,000 of those uh, are foreign born. So they're half of our labor force growth. So that's really significant, uh, which means that there really is no way to grow the labor force without the immigration, at least not at any pace that can meet uh, you know, the demands uh, on, on the labor demand side. Um, so I think, I don't know if you guys find that surprising number, Usually when I tell people it's their half of growth, they're not half of the labor force, obviously. They're only 17% of the labor force, but they're literally 45% of the growth in the labor force in an average year. Very hard to grow the economy without immigration in this country. So that's a big takeaway. And that's what I thought was, you know, people are going to realize that in the, you know, in the pandemic, and then we're going to, you know, we're all going to understand that we need immigration reform. And, you know, but yeah, it, hasn't happened yet. All right, so, so the economic consequences of this, um, you know, what happened in the labor force and, the, and the, the decline in immigration. So labor markets tightened, and I was trying to, to give you some idea earlier about what that means for a central banker when the labor market tightens or for an employer who's trying to hire. So it means the unemployment rate is declining or, or low. And so a tight labor market is going to be uh, below average unemployment rates. And so you can see here, and I plotted, I included Texas, just so you can see how high the unemployment rate uh, went in that pandemic recession, um, but then how quickly it came down. Uh, and so, you know, it was just a soaring unemployment rate and then very quickly came down. And now we're back to historically low levels of of unemployment, which is, again, consistent with tight labor markets. I will say, though, as even as the unemployment was coming down, that there was some discussion that, you know, how good of a measure is the unemployment rate of tightness in the labor market? Because this is really looking at the supply of workers. But we can also look at the demand for workers when we look at what firms are doing. So that's what we did here. So firms, when they want to hire, they're typically posting their jobs. Um, you know, uh, nowadays online, I guess, used to be in the newspaper. But uh, so job openings, um, here you can see total job openings um, are still about 11 million and went almost as high as 12 million. Uh, and then job openings per unemployed, so at its peak we had almost two jobs per unemployed worker in the U.S. And you can see, look at both those lines, I mean, they're just at record, at record levels. So 11 million unfilled jobs and two jobs for every person looking. So that's a tight labor market. And um, so I think another thing that we learned coming out of the pandemic is not just to look at the supply side, not just to look at the unemployment, but if you really want to understand, you need to also look at the demand side for labor. And this is, these are two measures that are really useful for that. Another measure that if you follow the discussion about tight labor markets is the quit rate. And um, the quit rate uh, is also, um, it's a measure of the willingness of people to leave one job and to take another. And so typically, if you're quitting your job, it's because you're pretty confident 
you're going to get another job. So typically high quit rate, which I didn't bring with me today, but um, which is also at record highs, um, that quit rate shows that people are very confident that they can go out and get a job with a, with a different employer. So all these are measures of, of labor market tightness. And so what happens then is you have record wage growth, right? As the economy is trying to balance supply and demand, you're going to have to pay a lot more to get those workers in the door. Uh, and so this is employment, uh, the ECI index, which is actually a very useful wage index because um, it's controlling for the composition of the workers uh, in, as they measure their wages. And so sometimes if you use other measures of wages, you can have compositional changes that drive the wage. So you might, if all of a sudden, so what we found um, initially is that, uh, you know, in the, in the pandemic, a lot of the, the low-skilled workers were laid off. So then it looked like wages were going up, but it was actually a change in the composition of who was earning those wages. And then uh, when they came back, it looked like wages were not growing as quickly, but it was a change in the composition of the workforce. So, so the ECI is a good measure, um, and that is telling us 5.2% year-on-year um, wage growth in the latest, in the latest measure. Um, and so that's, uh, that's very significant inflation. Measures suggest how much is this contributing to sort of the core inflation that, that we're, that the Fed measures for, you know, as it tries to set the monetary policy. Um, it's between, depending on how you measure it, it's between one third and two thirds of the inflation that we're seeing um, that, that needs to be addressed. So um, when you want to know how much of this wage increase, is it worse in low-wage industries, perhaps, where there might be more immigrants working in some cases? So here we see that um, the wage growth, which is on the vertical axis, is actually uh, far higher in the industries that employ uh, workers at lower average hourly earnings. So, uh, you can see leisure and hospitality, for example, that includes uh, 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 hotel and restaurants, and so those are, that's a low-wage industry, and that has had the highest wage growth during this pandemic. Uh, and then there's uh, the retail industry after that, and so that's another relatively low-wage industry that also has had very high wage growth. So initially, well, really until just the last few months or so, we saw significantly higher wage growth among low-skilled workers than high-skilled workers. Um, so that's been, you know, that's one good thing, I guess, about the pandemic. The problem is that, you know, inflation has been outstripping everybody's, not everybody's wage. At the very, at the low end of the, of the, of the wage distribution, we have actually seen, um, that wages have grown faster than inflation overall, but um, for the rest of workers, it generally has not. Um, so, um, so there, that means your real wage is still going down, which is not not a good thing. All right, and then the other. Oh, look, we looked at this also to see our wages then also rising faster in immigrant-intensive sectors. And so here along the horizontal axis, we have the share of workers that are foreign born in, in those industries that are plotted here. And so other services, construction, of course, is a huge outlier, leisure and hospitality, professional business services. We have both industries that employ high shares of low skill immigrants and high shares of, of high skill immigrants. And so um, they tend to, you know, the line is a little bit positively sloped, and so they are, on average, whether it's low skill or high skill, wages are rising a little bit faster in those immigrant intensive sectors than they are in sectors that are less intensive in, in immigrants. And that's just another reflection of the fact that the immigrant labor supply pretty much dried up in the pandemic. Um, I thought I'd show you a few visa categories just to go through sort of, we see really a broad-based uh, collapse, and they're all interesting, though, because they're all slightly different. So we bring people in in a lot of different ways in the, in the American economy. Here's temporary worker visas, and so, um, you know, you saw that I showed you the drop in immigration from 2016 to 2020 uh, overall but it wasn't temporary worker visas. <laughs> they kept going up. So uh, those people that were, uh, that, you know, preferred fewer immigrants did not prefer fewer temporary workers. So it's, uh, 
which is fun because I always talk about, yeah, <laughs> do we need a temporary worker program? Uh, so, so here you go. Um, yeah, so temporary worker visas were going up, 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 and they were reaching uh, over a million a year, uh, and then they obviously collapsed in the, in the pandemic. Um, what kind of temporary workers do we bring in and which ones saw the biggest declines? Um, the biggest decline was in this, uh, it's the seasonal really exchange program. It's like the J-1 visa, which, um, you know, usually I see when the J-1 workers are usually uh, college educated kids that come from other countries and spend a summer working here, maybe at Six Flags or, you know, they go and work in a, a ski resort. Uh, in, uh, you know, in Colorado, and so you run into, like, you'll go skiing in Colorado and everybody who works in the mountains from another country, has that happened to you? I mean, then you're like, oh, wait, how does this work? Oh, they're J-1s. So, uh, so we bring in, I mean, uh, uh, you know, over um, 300,000 of those every year, but that completely collapsed uh, in the pandemic. Um, the one category that did not uh, collapse is the uh, H-2A workers. That's the green line. Those are the farm workers. So that was another really interesting thing that happened in the pandemic. We decided that um, some workers are essential. <laughs> so, which for an economist is kind of funny because like I would say all workers are essential. Professor Clark, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, but I mean, yes, yeah, some are essential. I'm not sure, you know, but anyway, that was, that was an argument used to sort of um, defend immigration and keep some of these immigrants coming in and certainly the H-2As, the farm workers, most of them are coming from Mexico. They were allowed in, even as the border closed. And obviously because, the, and it was a good decision because they're picking the, picking the crops and, um, and so getting food on the table and obviously helping um, tamp down food prices because if you didn't have that, um, how would you, um, you know, you'd have, you'd have um, supply chain issues in the food market. So, so, so that was good. So they, they were allowed in still. Um, but then H-2B workers, which are other seasonal workers that are not farm, so those are also like people who come in and work on golf courses and stuff like that. They, um, some construction, so they, uh, they dropped off. They were not deemed essential, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, there's just interesting different pattern depending on, um, depending on what uh, class of, of work you were in uh, as a temporary foreign worker. Um, <clears throat> what about permanent resident visas? Now that's one category that really did start dropping. So big of that drop that began in 2016, that's mostly uh, due to fewer green cards. Um, and those green cards that really decline are the immediate relatives of US citizens. Um, and so those had already been falling pretty uh, sharply before the, uh, before the pandemic. And um, other visas also like refugees in the in the red line had also declined um, during that during that period before the pandemic um, and so we really see that there was a lot going on in terms of the the green card program even before the pandemic um, and so it wasn't so much in the pandemic about they were already had slowed the processing they were increasing the barriers and increasing the requirements on these people coming in things like uh, if you're bringing your elderly parents they have to show that they have health insurance um, otherwise they're going to be deemed a burden uh, and they won't be allowed to get their green card so things like that that we didn't have before that were implemented and then that really cut off the a lot of the flow um, here's another one I know you guys are going to like this because you're here in Laredo and you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, I, I told you that in, in, in 2020 immigration basically went to zero. Um, there was an economic recovery and legal immigration uh, had been stopped because the borders had been closed and consulates had been closed. Um, but of course there's always, there's always the other immigration, right? So if you plot, and this is not really immigration, this is apprehensions by the Border Patrol, so it's just like a real-time proxy that we, we use just to get an idea of like what's really going out out there. And so, and so what happened? So you see, even this type of immigration certainly dipped in the, the pandemic recession, very early part of 2020. And then as the economy recovers, it just builds back up and builds back up. And I like to point to sort of the red, the red part of this chart, which, that red part is really, sing it's single adults. So those guys are coming for work, and they're mostly from Mexico. 
And we had not really seen much migration of this kind from Mexico for a decade, really since the beginning of the Great Recession. Um, there were years after the Great Recession, like 2010, 2011, 2012, where net migration from Mexico was negative. And we'd never seen that before. And so we were not really having those flows of unauthorized workers that we had been, you know, really grown accustomed to for, for before that. Um, but of course, you know, when the government doesn't let in the legal <laughs> immigrants and employers are screaming for workers and there's tons of jobs out there and wages are going up, you know, for these low skilled workers, 10, 15 percent, and they're paying all of a sudden $15 a Chick-fil-A. I mean, these guys are going to come in. And if you look at how Mexico was doing during that period of time, not that great. So, so in they came. And um, you know, it's hard to find them in the household data. Earlier, the numbers I was showing you are from the household survey. And so they're a little bit hard to find in there, especially when they're recent arrivals. Um, but I think the apprehensions data um, you know, gives you an idea of, of what happens. And there's lots of research out there that shows when the labor market booms in the US, especially when wages are rising, that this type of immigration, which is unencumbered by really regulation, um, that they respond in real time to labor demand in the US. And they're still able to get hired. So interesting, interesting point. And then we'll get back to this at the, at the end. So um, all right, so, so let me get to my last point. Um, well, this, I guess I'll build up to it. So, so first I want to show you this because, um, so I, this is the same line for uh, net migration uh, in blue, the same line that I showed you on the very first chart when I told you this is net flows. Uh, and net flows went to zero in 2020. Uh, so, but on top of that is the red line and that's the natural rate of increase in the population. And that's, uh, that's births minus deaths. Okay, so those are the two ways that the population can grow, through migration and births, min births you know, minus deaths. And um, so, uh, so the interesting part here is that both are, uh, both are declining, actually. Births are falling uh, before the pandemic. Um, and uh, we actually have a, a, a sort of put out a blog article about the decline in the birth rate because it's been falling uh, really since 2007, as you can see. This is births minus deaths, but deaths don't really matter until the pandemic. So deaths is kind of a constant rate, constant rate. So when you see the decline in that red line, that's the declining birth rate. That's fewer kids being born every year per, per woman. And so, so that's interesting, we've written about that, but then what's really interesting is that starting in 2016, 2017, you know, those two lines get really close, which suggests that they're contributing equally to population growth, and then, of course, they both collapse together. So, um, and of course, the most interesting is the last observation in 2021, where immigration, when it rebounded a little bit from the pandemic, and they reopened the borders, that it actually came in higher um, than, the, than the number of people added through natural increase. Of course, the story there is a very sad one because it's we lost so many people to COVID. There's so many people died. Well, I can't remember what the number was. Um, it was 700, 800,000, I don't know. It's getting close to a million people that have died from COVID. Um, so, um, so, but this is sort of the first time we've seen, you know, that the net increase from immigration in 2021, even at that very low level, actually surpassed uh, the number of people added through natural increase. But then, of course, the reason was not just the falling birth rate, but the high uh, mortality from COVID. Okay. So then we look at the Gallup polls and we say, well, you know, are you convinced now that immigrants are important to the economy? We need immigrants uh, if we want to grow. Um, not sure. So what are we looking at here? So uh, let's see. This one asks, um, what do you think is the most important problem facing this country today? And what I like about this is it goes back really far so you can sort of plot responses over time. So this is the people that are, the share of the people asked that are saying immigration is the country's biggest problem. Um, and so it really got to a peak in 2018. Um, and so it had never been that high before. 
Um, and if you think of all the problems we have in this country, it's like for 25% 25 25 of people to say that the biggest problem is immigration, that's, that's a big number. Um, but then, of course, with COVID, when COVID came, that you know dropped down close to zero, and that's because everyone started answering COVID is our biggest problem. Um, there's been a little bit of bounce back, um, but not too bad um, in 2021, and then it's been trending down in 2022. So I'm hopeful, um, you know, based on poll results like this, that there's, you know, in general less, uh, you know, less anti-immigrant sentiment out there than perhaps there was, you know, five years ago or or, or ten years ago. Um, here's another question. Um, also Gallup poll. This is the share saying, um, so they ask, um, uh, in your view, should immigration um, be maintained at present levels, increased or decreased? Um, and so what's interesting here is that for the first time ever, I don't know if my little pointer works, but if you go all the way to the right end of the chart, you see that dashed line has risen above the black line and um, that is the share who said increase has actually surpassed the share who said decrease. And that's the first time that's ever happened. So, you know, this is a little bit of support for my hypothesis that people after our experience in the pandemic, people should be, you know, have a greater, have better information about the role of immigrants in the labor market and for economic growth. So we'll see, you guys can, Tell me later if you're convinced as well. All right, so what are the, um, let's summarize and then let's, let's get to your questions. So what have we talked about today? We talked about the demand side uh, labor market indicators, things like the vacancy rate, um, the quit rate, um, as well as record wage inflation. Um, they point really to a very tight labor market in the pandemic recovery. And this was very much made worse by a pandemic-induced immigration shortfall um, that in retrospect, we didn't notice it or really even think about it or really even talk about it when it happened. But of course, looking back, uh, you know, we said, gosh, of course the labor market tightened up incredibly quickly because those, what, probably 600,000 workers that would have come within those 18 months that the borders were closed, they didn't come, and that really made the situation worse. Um, the other thing, and we could talk more about this, but the pandemic highlighted, of course, we've been talking about the short run, mostly, the short run surge in labor demand um, and the fall in labor supply, right, during the pandemic. That's kind of a more of a short run phenomenon um, and the need for foreign labor in this re respect. But, what we really haven't talked about, although we could talk more, we talked about natural increase, but I didn't really go on about what really, this is really not just a short run or a pandemic issue. This is really a long run issue. Um, so if you look at the demographic trends um, in the US population, you can see we have an aging population. Uh, we have the retirement of the baby boomers, which is ongoing. Um, and so we're actually slipping now to the point where until from now until 2035, um, native, uh, native workers in, in the labor force are not gonna grow in number at all, according to demographers. And so all the growth is projected to be from, from immigration. And so if you don't have immigration, you, you won't have growth. Um, and so that is the long run aspect of this problem that was really kind of condensed and accelerated in the pandemic. Like the pandemic did a lot of that, right? It sped up these trends that were already out there. Things that we were seeing, like technological change, all of a sudden, wow, you know, we get 10 years worth of technological change in two years. Um, well, we also got to really um, see very quickly and very uh, close up what happens when the native labor force does not grow. In fact, it's shrinking and we cut off immigration, and then what happens? Uh, real problems for the labor market. So might there be more appetite for immigration reform as a result? Well, um, so there are steps by um, the current administration in Washington to increase certain visas, and they've certainly attempted immigration reform in various ways, uh, unsuccessfully, obviously, given how closely divided the Congress is. 
Um, we do, we, I mentioned that advocates during the pandemic are arguing for essential workers. Now, you know, I didn't really like calling some workers essentials and other non-essentials, but, um, but still, I mean, everyone is trying on the political stage is trying to find an angle. <laughs> what can work? You know, how can we get people, how can we convince people, uh, you know, that immigrants are important? So we'll call them essential and then maybe they'll care. Uh, so, you know, there, so there's that. Um, that, I mean, it's another positive sign, you know, we're, we're trying to you know, convince uh, that this is important. Um, and I think, you know, as I showed you on those Gallup polls, I mean, public opinion has been trending more favorable. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, I also showed you the chart of the Border Patrol apprehensions. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's like, uh, I feel like probably politicians, and I'm not one, you know, obviously, but, uh, you know, whenever they would try to step in a room with the other side and try to say, well, let's do immigration reform. Well, why don't you control your border first? <laughs> Something like that might happen uh, because we are at record apprehensions. Um, and so, but then, of course, you know, if it's an economist looking at that data, you would say, well, now really is the time to do it because obviously people are coming, you know, unauthorized you know, to fill labor demand, and so we should just authorize it, right? It's a great opportunity for reform. Uh, well, great, guys, that's all I had. I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> Professor Clark is going to monitor the questions on chat. Okay, so um, we're going to now enter the, the, the question and answer session. So we've got, uh, uh, we, we, we've, we've got over 150 people online who, who will, will hopefully type um, questions into the, into, into the Q&A that we can ask. Um, but uh, if you're in the audience, just stick up your hand and we've got students here and here and probably somewhere else at the back um, who will bring you a microphone. So, so um, you can ask your question directly, and we'll, tr we'll kind of alternate between online questions and in-person questions as it, as it goes on. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, the chair's prerogative and ask the, f the, f the, f the first question. And one, one thing that struck me during your discussion was you, you didn't mention what happened to student um, immigration into the US. And I, the reason I was wondering whether that was important was because um, that could have a delayed effect. Um, students not entering now won't affect the labor force immediately, but it will have an effect, you know, two, three, four, five years down is when they, when they don't enter the U.S. labor force after graduating with their master's degrees and their engineering degrees and their, and their, and their PhDs. Do you think that will be important in the future? Oh, it's hugely important. So, um, so we wrote a blog about this, Dallas Fed Economics, and you can go on the Dallas Fed website and read it, but it's all about um, the collapse in um, student visas, um, student, student visa issuances, which also began around 2015, 2016. Um, so I think what partly led to that, again, you know, um, certain people don't like China, and so there was a lot of rhetoric, anti-China rhetoric, and actually part, I think part of the uh, consequence was that Chinese students stopped applying for a student visas to come and study in the United States. And so we just saw a huge collapse uh, in the number of student visas that were being issued. Um, and it wasn't just uh, us being tougher on who was coming in, but it was actually applications were down. Uh, and I think universities have experienced also a drop in, you know, their foreign students, uh, which is, of course, a good revenue source for universities. <laughs> so, um, and then, as you were alluding to, uh, George, is that, uh, you know, for the future, uh, a lot of the foreign students that come in, especially as graduate students, they end up getting jobs here and staying. Um, and so they're actually, you know, very high-skilled immigrants contributing really to a lot of sectors that are important for economic growth and productivity growth, like the STEM sector. Um, and so with that flow cut off, um, you know, that, that's also, um, you know, an ominous sign for sort of the direction that we're headed. Are there any questions from the audience? If you'd like to stick up your hand, we'll have the students bring you the microphones. Um, um, uh, thank you for the presentation, great presentation. And, and uh, <clears throat> we were just talking about the labor shortage and you know, our question was, well, why don't we have comprehensive uh, immigration reform? You know, it's, it's so obvious. 
But <laughs> my question is more along the lines of government, uh, government stimulus, and just like when the economies are not growing, government steps in and comes up with projects to stimulate the economy, why couldn't the government right now step in and instead of increasing the rate so fast, delay new government projects to reduce the demand for construction materials, the demand for labor, and try to help reduce that inflation from a different angle because increasing the rates uh, has another, another implication. Well, then how would the politicians get reelected? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so then that, that proves my point. You know, immigration reform has not happened because at the end of the day, it's a political decision and no one wants to sacrifice their political career. And so unfortunately, our country's where we are because all of the decisions are made based on politics as opposed to doing the right thing. Well, hopefully there's a mix of both. But um, I think the heart of your question is really interesting because what you're talking about is that you can sort of, you can try to manage the economy uh, from a fiscal perspective and not just from the monetary policy, but also through fiscal policy with fiscal uh, stimulus or lack thereof. And so, um, um, and, and you're absolutely right because I think also if you go back to the pandemic and when there was a lot of stimulus programs, you know, I think five trillion plus in, in stimulus dollars coming from the federal government into the economy in what, 18 months? I mean, it's just 25% uh, of GDP. And so it's huge, you know. So that certainly um, you know, had an impact on demand, which impacted prices, which has partly led to the situation that we're in. But of course, um, you know, there's, there's lots of blame to go around. Um, but, I, but I appreciate that you pointing out that that's another way that you can slow the economy. You can slow, you can slow government spending. Thank you. Again, I also agree. Thank you very much, Dr. Renius. Uh, you know, every time you come here, you add, you add more, more dimensions to this discussion at this university on demographics and our and our and our uh, just our overall uh, challenges that we have on the border and in our country. Uh, I was in Washington. I was in Mexico City, and Will Hurd, uh, former congressman, mm -hmm. just put out a book, and we in uh, and we had an extensive conversation in regards to the F one visa, the student visas again going back, mm -hmm. and all of these visas are temporary visas. And there's so many different categories of visas out there to, to label a worker or that we need. Uh, the terms of these visas vary. The F1 visas are one year for students, I believe is still the case. So his argument was, why don't we make these F1 visas five years, okay? Um, and, um, and then the discussion got into the H. Uh, visas, which are the worker visas, H-1Bs, H1, H-2s, and those are also have all these term limits. Um, and then Dan Griswold was here. Uh, I'm sure you know yes. Dan Griswold. He's been with us as well. And he also spends a lot of time talking about the H-1 or the different types of visas. And we put these quotas, or the government puts these quotas on them. Give us your thoughts in regards to extending and, and or the terms of these visas, how valid are they? And do they still hold ground today to when they first were implemented or those conditions were placed many years ago when our workforce was different than what it is today? Yeah, no, you raise a lot of, uh, a lot of really important points about the way our immigration policy works. So the number one problem is that, and I showed you how, you know, the government likes the temporary visas and so they went up, up, up. Um, and they'll probably continue, you know, resume growing again. Uh, but the problem is that uh, when uh, people come in on these temporary visas on limited duration um, and they want to stay, um, there's no green card for them. Uh, and that's because the quota on the temporary visas is much higher than the quota on, on green cards, permanent residence visas. Uh, and so that's how we get these huge queues of people especially from countries that are very populous, because on top of all this, we have country quotas, right? So we can't have uh, the, to prevent all the immigrants being from one country. So, so countries like China and India, Philippines, you know, Mexico to a certain extent, 
Um, they're back up against their country quota, and so their, perm their green cards are even more limited. Um, and so this mismatch between temporary visas and um, those temporary people who want to stay and have a job offer and, you know, or, or a place at a university, um, you know, they can't stay. Uh, and so uh, that's, it's a terrible problem and, you know, it could be, it could be easily fixed. Um, so extending the duration of, of temporary visas is certainly, um, is certainly a possible. And plus, I mean, a one-year visa is sort of, you probably spend more in the bureaucracy of administering that visa than, you know, than it's worth. And so I think going from one-year visas to three-year visas in some of these cases, I think, is, is a good idea. But I think the fundamental problem is for those students and, and workers that we want to keep, that employers want to keep, uh, uh, keep employed, uh, what we really, at the end of the day, is we need more green cards. Right. And, at, and at the same, there's a follow-up to that, but at the same time, you may have conditions, and you, were, you alluded it earlier in your presentation, the refugees. Mm -hmm. Ukrainian refugees, from what, six months ago, we weren't, or a year ago, we weren't talking about a million or two million Ukrainian refugees being allowed to, or Afghanis uh, refugees as well. They go into the labor force as well here under a separate set of conditions. And the impact of the refugee influx that's allowed versus all of these that are on the temporary visa status. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, complex. Uh, it's it's in incredibly complex in terms of who gets the work permit um, and, you know, how long does that last uh, and, and, and who doesn't. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, for unauthorized immigrants, we have a lot of those, and they don't get the work permits, and they're all working. So, uh, so that's yeah, it's 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 a tangled web, I guess. And uh, I think the details, um, but you know, it's not that hard to fix. That's the thing. That's like kind of a it's kind of like like it's so complicated. It'd be so easy to come in and just fix it all up and make it simple and make it work. <laughs> they don't. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions online. In the meanwhile, if you're in the audience and you have a question, just stick up your hand and they'll bring one, uh, the microphone to you so, they could, so you can quickly get into your question afterwards. So my first online question is from Christine Murillo, and she wants to know what would be the worst and best case scenarios if they manage immigration reform to allow more immigrants to come in and work? Oh, um, that's an interesting question. Um, so like the worst case, immigration policy and the best immigration policy? Hmm. I guess that's kind of opinion, but, um, well, so I would say, um, so bad immigration policy, I mean, points is, yeah, what we have. <laughs> Worst case scenario is we keep what we have. <laughs> that's a good one, thank you for that. Um, best case scenario, uh, I've written a book on this with uh, my co-author Madeline Zavodny, and so we have a plan. I think it's still pretty, uh, a pretty good plan, and I think it's 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 workable. And we actually central to our plan is that um, obviously the people that you want to stay will be able to stay, so you don't have this mismatch between uh, permanent and, and temporary. Uh, but the other thing that we would do in terms of allocating visas is we would have auctions. So, you know, for those of you who are economic students, especially in micro, if you've studied auctions, that's like every micro, every economist, like, oh, I love auctions. Because, you know, the, the, you know you, you, when, it's, when the value is greatest to you, you'll pay the most for it, right? So that's a great way to allocate visas, and we argue in this book. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just, that's just one way. Uh, but I think, yeah, there's um, most anything that you could do at this point would probably be an improvement over the status quo. But actually, I think we're moving in the opposite direction. Um, you know, uh, we're not really moving towards the goal, which is better policy. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other more questions from the audience? Anyone? Hi. Hi. Mostly just an observation, or I don't know if we have data. When the asylum seekers stopped, they basically stopped because they stayed outside the country. So here in Nuevo Laredo, we had a lot of people in camps. Mm -hmm. Do we have a number of how many people um, were prevented from seeking asylum? Uh, from the Remain in Mexico pro uh, program? 
Yes. Gosh, I don't think I have a number. I don't know if anyone else has seen a number. Out of the, supposedly, out of the, out of the estimated two million, uh, approximately one point seven of those may be asylum seekers, and the the remaining pulp, the remaining in Mexico applied to those as their cases are being adjudicated. But those 1.7 are still being adjudicated you know, as well. And that will continue for years to come. But they're now allowed to come. No, but they're here now. Yeah, they're letting them in. So I don't think there's that many left, right, on the other side uh, of the remain in Mexico. And they've been gradually been let in um, and given some temporary status, I guess, when, if they can apply for asylum. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, but in terms of the numbers that were deterred by it, I mean, you can sort of, if you like really go, want to go and look like month by month at the apprehensions data, or if you can find other immigration data, maybe from Central America or Mexico, you can try to see like what are the different, because we implemented so many new policies during that period of time, and you can kind of see the reaction uh, of, of the numbers to the policies, you know, if you're a little bit creative. So, um, and I've st the research is starting to come out on this, but for example, things like remain in Mexico would have been a deterrent. Um, and the separation of families, you know, the parents from the children, I think those were the type of really um, policies that really um, were, um, you know, terrible, but also, you know, deterrents. Uh, and so we went from having a really a skyrocketing apprehensions, I think it was it in 2018, and then implemented these policies to stop it, um, and, and it, and it did go down. But the secret there uh, was that there was cooperation with Mexico, and um, the Mexican administration I was actually helped out by stopping people at their border with Guatemala, and so you know, it's, I guess the tricky part there is trying to figure out how much is the U.S. policy in each of these cases versus how much is it what Mexico did stopping people on their southern border and not letting them transit. Excellent. Thank you. We have another question down here. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very Thank good. Uh, question for you. Do you feel we're in a recession right now? Uh, uh, I mean, the standard definition is two, two quarters of uh, negative GDP. Of course, it's a very different recession, if, if that's what you think we are in, uh, because of the, of the low unemployment. Uh, and uh, with, the, with the high inflation, probably about 8 percent, I know the producer price index came in today twice, twice the amount of the, 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 the estimate. So uh, where do you think the Federal Reserve is going to go with the second question? And, and will we have a soft landing? <laughs> the question on everybody's mind. When, so, <clears throat> so I'll take, well, um, are we in recession now? Uh, no. Uh, so if you take sort of the uh, official uh, recession dating committee uh, at the NBR, uh, when they determine a recession, they're looking at lots of indicators, not just GDP. So this idea that two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth is a recession is just like a rule of thumb for the press. Um, and so, but the economists actually look at more indicators. I think there's like six or seven of them, and several of them have to do with the labor market. So with the labor market being so strong and um, job growth creation uh, or job growth being so high and the unemployment rate so low, um, I think there's a very slim chance that they would ever call this year, at least you know, so far, a recession. So, so we're not in recession, that's sort of the official uh, word on that. Um, <clears throat> can we achieve a soft landing? Um, I mean, I think everyone's divided on that. I think that if you listen to what the policymakers are saying from the Federal Reserve, they've been very adamant about um, inflation is the number one enemy right now. We have to get inflation down. Um, and as Chair Powell said, uh, you know, here recently, you know, it's going to take some pain. And so some people interpret the pain as meaning there's going to be a recession, and some people don't. Uh, people are forever helpful, you know, hopeful that you know, it's not going to be recession and we're going to be able to slow inflation without um, actually shrinking the economy. And that obviously would be, uh, would be the best outcome. Um, but there's a lot of doubters out there. Um, and so I think 
if it takes a recession, there will be a recession. I mean, the, they're going to watch the inflation data come in, and if they don't see what they want to see, then they're going to, you know, if that's, if that's what it takes to slow inflation, I think for economists, especially the macroeconomists that are doing monetary policy, that are looking out for the macroeconomy, I mean, they see it's absolutely imperative to slow inflation um, because it's, you know, takes away from, from, you know, how we live and how we earn and, and, and our standard of living. And, and once the inflation goes on and becomes ingrained in inflation expectations, um, you know, it's even, then it's going to require, you know, an even larger recession to, to, to stop it. And so that's really the key is to engineer either a soft landing or a short, mild recession just enough to slow inflation and to, you know, get us back on track again. Fingers Thanks. crossed. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Let's take another question from online. So this is from Pedro Flores, and he wants to know, how does immigration affect the military and military recruiting? Um, will it shrink the military if we, if we reduce Im immigration um, due to not recruiting from non-citizens? Oh, and that's interesting. Actually, a question I don't know how to answer. <laughs> Um, so, I know the military is having a terrible time recruiting, just like employers, other employers are, and um, they probably do pull disproportionately from, uh, you know, either immigrants or the children of immigrants, probably, um, in many cases. And so, this is probably, you know, um, less immigration, especially of the type that they can uh, recruit for the armed forces, I think, would probably make things harder for them. Um, <clears throat> but I really like the question because <clears throat> he's tying, uh, tying this argument into national security argument. You see how he did that? That was smart, Pedro. So, uh, so I like that uh, because immigration is so many things. And so, you know, it can be the economy. It can be national security. Uh, you know, it can, be, uh, it can be diplomacy. It can, you know, it can be a lot of things. Excellent. So I think we have a question from the audience again. Sure, thank you for a good presentation. And um, I know it seemed, things might seem dire here, but I'm curious, what does it look like in other countries, other advanced industrial economies? Are, are they better, worse off? Is there a place we should worry about, a place we should be looking towards, or is the United States kind of in the best possible position compared to other places? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I guess, um, we're, we're lucky in the United States for, I mean, we, we're lucky in the United States uh, for many reasons, uh, obviously, but right now, looking at Europe, we're luckier than we usually are in the sense that their energy crisis uh, is, is, is very serious. Uh, with Russia cutting off gas exports uh, to the European Union or using also future gas supplies as a weapon against um, against Europe, uh, I think, um, you know, really puts ec their economic growth in peril. And obviously, the increases in, in ga natural gas prices or electricity prices that they've experienced is 10 times what we've experienced here. So they're in much worse shape um, in terms of the outlook for their economies. Uh, and when the winter comes, of course, places like Germany and so forth that now, like I said, uh, natural gas prices or electricity prices have increased tenfold, um, you know, how are they even going to pay uh, for electricity? How are they going to warm their houses or keep their machines running at the factories and so forth? So the outlook is, is, is dire or grim, I guess, in Europe in terms of, um, in, for all those reasons. Um, we don't have that. Uh, I mean, obviously, energy prices have gone up here quite a bit. Um, my electric bill is horrible. I was very upset about that, but it's increased, you know, threefold, not tenfold. I don't know how people handle it if it goes tenfold. <clears throat> so we're lucky to have such ample energy supplies um, that keeps the price down, especially of, of electricity uh, in our region and um, and in the country. While you know, we're also um, uh, confronting inflation, much like they are in Europe, um, so that that's a significant uh, issue that we're facing. But we're not facing, you know, war or Putin's not like, you know, in Canada or something. So, so that so that's <clears throat> we're lucky that way. Um, but my, I guess my concern more broadly is that um, inflation uh, and central bank tightening. So the the raising of the interest rate by the central bank 
to address inflation is is so widespread in the world this time. It's almost like a synchronized global tightening of the um, of, of of the um, of monetary conditions, and so that's uh, that's a little bit scary because if everybody slows at the same time, that with the spillovers that happen between countries that can really lead to a deeper recession. Um, so those that's that's concerning. It's concerning. And it's unusual that inflation really has surged across so many countries in such a similar way as has happened here. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 something that we'll have to watch. Um, I mean, we're in a good place. Well, especially we're in Texas. We're in the best place. No, just kidding. But uh, <laughs> but if you're in the U.S., you'd want to be in Texas. No, just so um, yeah. <laughs> so you know, at the end of the day, you know, it could be worse. Okay, so let me read the next question from online. This is from Lords Boardman, and she's making you do a dangerous prediction of the future here. <laughs> she wants to know, along with this research and pandemic I impact, do you think that the negative stigma about the impact of immigrants um, have on the economy has changed and is going to change in the future? I think it has changed a little bit uh, with what we've been through. Uh, I think that, um, I mean, I, I, I think that we'll always be able to point back to this, what happened in the pandemic, um, this sort of natural experiment that what happened to the economy when we closed the border and no immigrants came, you know, it's like that movie about there were no, you know, you wake up and there's, you know, no Mexicans or whatever the movie was called. But I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a catastrophe. <laughs> I mean, it's, it can have all these negative knock on effects and so, um, so I think, uh, I mean, my hope is that, yes, as a result, you know, there'll be better appreciation um, for the contribution of immigrants um, and that some of the stigma will, will go away. Thank you. Um, we have a question down here in the audience. Um, yeah, so it's known that the signs of a dying society are an aging population and lack of immigration. Um, the problem, I think, is that it isn't known by, you know, the majority of people. So I don't think our issue is more of a political. I mean, it is political right now, but I think it's also educational. What if in, like, because the U.S. has always had an anti-immigration sentiment since, like, the Irish, the Chinese, Mexicans, like, it's always been like this. So maybe teaching, like, since elementary, um, that immigration is a good thing because it causes economic growth could potentially help us overcome this political issue in the future. Oh, yeah. And then for uh, the present, maybe if we just like raise taxes on them or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Who are we going to raise taxes give them, on? Uh, immigrants. Just give them a green card, raise their tax rate, and you know, <laughs> benefits us now and in the future. After five years, lower it back down so to the standard. So you think like I think. There's always a solution. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, so, um, yeah, I agree. I mean, education uh, helps, um, but just also like better all around policies. Um, Cause I mean, some of the theory around, and I'm not a political scientist, so I don't really know this that well, but some of the theory around, um, you know, uh, people that have kind of risen up and, 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 and you know, part of the platform is, has, has become to be against, against immigration is because because of other problems that we have and that we haven't addressed, whether it's the opioid epidemic or um, the China shock, you know, with displaced a lot of people out of manufacturing in little towns and things like that, where, you know, there was nothing really good jobs to replace the jobs that were lost. And so we've gone through this big industrial transformation, you know, from being a manufacturing uh, economy to being more of a services based economy. And so there's been, you know, hurt and harm along the way. And so I think a reaction sometimes uh, to, you know, when the core issue of the problem is, is one thing, people may sometimes blame another thing. And so those things are, those things are related. So I think you can, you can address it with education, but you also need to address it by addressing some of those core issues that are making people unhappy. Um, and, and, and see, you know, what you, can, what you can do to address some of that malaise and, and some of the larger problems that we face. 
Yes, I have a question. Hello, uh, I'm a junior, and I wanted to skew a little bit from the topic of your presentation and ask you your opinion on the future of the U.S. housing market. Where do you see it in the year 2032? <laughs> 2030. What happens in 2032? I'm you're trying to plan ahead. You're going to buy a house <laughs> in 2032. Uh, well, the, in the mortgage rate will be lower. No, no, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen in 2032. But um, <clears throat> so, I mean, the housing market, it will be in a correction. It's in a correction now. So, um, but I think it's probably, um, um, it's probably a healthy thing for the most part because we had very uh, unhealthy, rapid appreciation of, of housing prices uh, in, in our state and also in the nation. So they're up, I don't know, over 40% really in the last two years on average, which is just, it's, that's not healthy because if you're, I mean, for so many reasons, but it may, it's much harder to, to buy a home for those that are just coming into, into the market. And then if you're frankly sitting in a home that's appreciated 40% in Texas, we have very high property tax rates. And so, you know, I get my property tax bill and I wonder, well, exactly, like, where are you gonna come up with this cash? Um, I mean, it's a big problem. So, uh, yeah, so we need, we need some correction uh, in that market. And so, but I don't think people are really um, saying that prices are gonna sort of like go down by 40% because they went up 40%. I think what people are saying is that they're gonna, you know, probably next year house price appreciation will be flat. There will be, there will be no house price appreciation. So. Um, you know, month over month, you'll see prices falling, but year over year, maybe we're going towards like a flat zero uh, year over year increase. Um, so, and then of course, you know, building will slow uh, and so forth. And, um, but I mean, after the craziness of the housing market and the pandemic, I think, um, you know, it's not entirely unwelcome. Thank you, I think we have a question down here. Good afternoon. I know you've been a student of demographics, and those of us who've looked at that know this issue has been coming for a long time, and we haven't reacted to it. I guess the question is, uh, from the Fed's perspective, looking at job growth, I don't understand why there's so much focus on that, because we have a five or six million labor force gap already between jobs available, as you pointed out, and workers. Isn't it a possibility that we've finally reached a point where our social safety nets are so big that people just aren't going back to work and that we're continuing to look for more ways not to work, like the 32-hour work week? And how are we going to solve this problem of this workforce shortage uh, because all the developed world is falling well below replacement? And even countries like Mexico that we look for for workers, they're now below replacement. So how are we going to manage social networks to get our labor participation rates up because in the United States it's terrible, 61 or 62 percent, and we are not going to fill that gap unless we have some major changes that causes people to go to work. They're just not working in this country anymore. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a great that's a great point. So, so we're definitely headed towards, for whatever reasons. I mean, whether both you know short maybe short run reasons, long run reasons. Um, the demographics of this country is leading us to, uh, we're going to enter this phase of, of very slow uh, labor force growth. So we're going to have probably, uh, you know, we're going to be living with, with worker shortages going forward. Um, so what are the consequences of that? Well, we talked about today, one thing you can do is increase immigration. Um, another one um, that you could do is obviously already being done with this auto automation. Um, and so some jobs, um, you know, can be, um, replaced um, some or, or, or done, you know, with, 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 with robotics or, or AI or other, other means. And so automation is part of the, part of the solution. Um, unfortunately, when you have bad immigration policy, one solution is offshoring. Um, and so we were actually talking to a group of businesses in, in Dallas, and they came to the Dallas Fed to meet our new boss, Lori Logan. And, um, you know, when um, we talked a little bit about the regional economy and the labor shortages, and they said, we have a terrible time hiring. And then, you know, one or two of them stood up and said, well, let me tell you what we're doing. We're, we're hiring overseas, you know? And so whether it's, you know, tech talent, like radiologists reading, you know, scans or, um, or other things. I mean, whether it's, you know, low skill, high skill, they're, they're, when they can, they're offshoring. 
And one thing about the work from home, you may love work from home, but that means that oh, somebody can do that job that you have when you're happy working from home. Well, somebody can work from home in the Philippines, or somebody can work from home in, uh, you know, in Indonesia. And so, you know, we may just be replaced by people working from home from somewhere else. So remote work is like a mixed blessing if you think about it that way. Um, there are other things we can do though to address. Like, again, I want to get back to, like, we have some really bad policies, even outside of, um, even outside of, uh, of immigration policy. So one is, so I'm thinking now, how can you encourage, for example, increased labor force participation? Well, um, there's tax policy changes you can make um, to increase the incentives of working, right? There's changes you can reform Social Security to increase incentives of working. Right, because if you're married, you don't have to work. You get your husband's uh, or your wife's social security, right? I mean, you could make you could make that social security bene be benefit be not a married benefit, but an individual benefit. That's an incentive to work. Um, there's other things, uh, marginal tax rates. Like if you're filing jointly as as married couple, and you're paying, you know, the secondary earner is paying the marginal tax rate of the primary earning. I mean, you're going. And if their income is much lower, they're paying a sky-high marginal tax rate. I mean, that could be changed. That should be changed. I mean, there's definitely a lot we could do to update our tax policy, economic policy, and other, you know, to sort of encourage, encourage work. Um, but you're really, uh, you're really pointing your finger at, at, at a huge problem, I think, which is that we've really been falling behind other countries in labor force participation, especially among women. So we had sort of women coming up and increasing labor force participation until 2000. And since then, when you compare to places like Canada, we used to be higher or at the same level of labor force participation as women in Canada. And now we've dropped far below. Um, so that's, and, and if you compare to European countries also. So there's something going on. And so, in the, and of course, uh, some people will say uh, the opposite of what you said, because you said, well, let's roll back the safety net but they might say maybe we need more safety net, maybe we need child care, you know, subsidized child care so that women can go to work, or maybe we need, you know, other things, like things, subsidize the things that we need so that we can go to work. You know, that could be another, the opposite view, I guess. Excellent. Let me take an online question quickly. Um, so this is from David Lamb, and what he wants to know is investment advice. <laughs> so he said, based on your research and the current immigration, economic, and political conditions, any ideas for sectors where one would possibly invest to best profit and or limit financial risk? <laughs> we have voted in the room here. <laughs> The first row says, keep your money in cash for the time being. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to be providing any investment advice. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, next, next online question is from Christina Marilla, and it relates to the earlier question we had. Um, she wants to check whether the information on labor force includes jobs that are remote jobs or not. And um, in your opinion, does working from home or being able to do so hurt the w workforce growth or, or, or help it? Um, yes, yeah, so if, it, if it's a remote job, um, as long as it's in this country, it's counted in the, you're in the labor force. If you're a worker, you're in the labor force. Um, and the, oh, is uh, remote work gonna help labor force growth? Yes, or, or hurt it. I think it would help, right? I mean, definitely, because it's more, people wanna do it, it's a more flexible arrangement. They can, you know, absolutely, it, sh it should help. Um, it, should, it, it should help. Um, yeah, because more, you know, definitely it's an incentive to, to come into the labor market. Um, we had, we had, a, we had a question down here, I think, over, over here, and, and we have another question over there in a second. Um, yes, I was saying, um, while I agree immigrant labor is important to the country as a whole, um, I think that it hurts the local border cities, um, the residents of the border cities who suffer financially. Um, because of the abundance of the low-wage jobs and lack of resources that the immigrants come across to work for because it's better from, from what they come from, um, but essentially hurts the local residents and keeps them in a cycle of poverty. What do you think that could be done, if anything, to reform the local border cities that deal with these issues on a daily basis with the born and raised residents living in these issues? Yeah, no, that's a great point. So we did hear 
you know, we were talking to, uh, to, to people along the border before they were going to open the border. And, um, you know, um, there's people on each side, you know, depending on where you are uh, and what you do. Um, some were uh, really looking forward to the border opening, obviously, the retailers downtown and that depend on the shoppers coming across. Um, businesses maybe that hire those workers that come in. Um, but we had definitely some anxiety on behalf of workers that actually probably enjoyed higher wages as a result of the, the lack of, of workers coming across the border and competing with them. Um, so that is a great point, and we didn't really touch on it in the, in the presentation. Um, it's tricky uh, because, um, yeah, you definitely, there, what do studies show? The studies show that um, for low-skilled workers, especially prior immigrants, um, and um, that there is a negative wage eff effect of, of new immigrants coming in. So if you're very similar t in, in job qualities to a new immigrant coming in, that's not going to help you in the labor market. That seems plausible. Um, some low-skilled natives, like high school, less than high school education, they also sometimes compete head-to-head -head with low-skilled immigrants. Um, the wage effects are pretty small. And the argument for still having that immigration, I guess, is twofold. So uh, the argument I make is that um, in the short run, you can have this negative wage impact. But in the medium to long term, what happens is the economy adjusts to the immigrants coming in, and businesses in particular adjust. If there's a lower cost of labor, there's more capital investment. And so in the medium term, you actually get investment that comes in, raises the capital stock, if you think of the economic model with sort of labor and capital. And when they raise capital, then wages are restored. So on average, the economic models show, and typically the empirical evidence is consistent with, within a few years, wages are restored. Um, but that only works if you have that business investment, you have that growing economy, you need sort of the full package. Um, if there's other things getting in the way uh, of people, uh, of that adjustment, you know, suppose uh, there's no lending by banks, uh, suppose, you know, there's no credit, uh, so people can't invest, there's no businesses coming in, that type of thing, then, then you're stuck in a, in, in, in a downward spiral. So then you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have, you wouldn't ha want to have more migration in, in that scenario. But you, you raise a great point, and I think, that's also a reason to make sure that um, you know you have uh, you know you don't bring in too many people too suddenly. Um, that you know that and then that people don't have some reason or some barrier that keeps them sort of from spreading out into the rest of the country. Like so, suppose for some reason you can't leave the border community because you won't get past the checkpoint. Uh, well, you know, then maybe that person should have you know, some other status so that they can go to where there's demand for that labor in the interior of the economy. I mean, I, I, would, say the, I would say those type of things, but you raise, a, uh, you raise a really valid point, and I think we need to think about that when we think about, um, you know, what kind of immigration policy we want to have. Thank you. I think we had another question down, down here. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my, co my question's a little uh, left field for your labor market uh, conditions. Do you feel that um, the current anti-abortion laws uh, will provide enough incentive for your future labor market periods um, that we've seen actually decline because of the birth rates? Um. Let me see how I can answer that question without getting in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, all I would say on, um, we were talking about, um, about how um, women's labor force participation has stagnated in the U.S. and how we're falling behind other countries. And, um, and the, there's literature out there on how uh, lack of access uh, to abortion and, and unintended sort of um, childbearing, that type of thing how it affects women. Um, and typically, you know, it reduces their labor force participation, reduces their earnings, reduces their education level. And so it's, it's not good for women economically. That's what, that's what I can say. And that's based on the, on the, on the research that's out there that's, um, 
you know, peer reviewed and published. So. Um, Um, so, so though, I mean, I don't see the connection between those laws and, and any economic argument because the economic argument would be the opposite, right? You want women to be educated, have, you know, um, participate in the labor force, uh, um, have high earnings, uh, you know, all those positive things that we see, you know, improve their standard of living. And so... There's a lot of policies that can be improved to get us to where we need to go. And economically, I think they're quite simple improvements to make. And politically, I think they may be you know, near impossible. <laughs> I think we're going to have to move on to our last question now. We're running out of time. So if we just uh, have our last question, that would be great. Oh, two more questions. Uh, so I'll ask my question. Or George, do you want me to go first, or Dr. Yes, Sears? Yes, go ahead. So I'll ask my question first, and, and then just the quick background. Um, and um, I really appreciate uh, it's, it's been a really engaging conversation. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, to what degree, and in your opinion, do you feel that the anti-immigrant rhetoric and bad immigration policies have led to teacher shortages? Um, um, so a little bit of background, of course. Uh, things that you already know. Population of the United States, 330 million. Texas holds up roughly 10% of that. 5.3 million students. So Texas is the state with the most number of school districts. Um, and in a couple of years, I think you've got some compounding factors. Uh, so the state of Texas increasing uh, accountability uh, requirements. So right now to become an elementary certified bilingual teacher with shifting demographics in Texas, that's the most important teacher right now. Uh, to educate our population, and so you, you've got uh, a disincentive for people to become teachers. And what a lot of people don't know is that we actually would, would hire a lot of teachers from different from other countries. Um, and so I haven't heard in, in, in the discourse about teacher shortages and, and people leaving the profession, I haven't heard any connection being made between, um, you know, to what degree these, these bad policies have affected um, um, you know, the immigrate, uh, us hiring teachers. And then when you think about it, we, we typically don't make the connection, but if we want to perpetuate democracy, we know that the only way that we can do that is through an educated workforce. So less teachers, less educated population, it's not only gonna, it's not only devastating for our democracy, but I would imagine that it also has uh, devastating impacts for our, for our economy as well. Uh, and so, again, that's a lot just to sim ask a question, you know, to what degree do you think that, you know, the anti-immigrant rhetoric and bad immigration policies are are affecting the, the current teacher shortage. That's a that's a great idea to look at um, sort of the link between this immigration drop off and certain professions where we're experiencing, in particular, very serious and disturbing shortages like like teaching. I know that certainly in DISD and other school districts in North Texas, we've been hiring. Um, bilingual teachers like from Monterey and from you know, parts in Mexico. Uh, and so that's, those programs have worked very well in the past. Now I don't know where they are at the moment and what's happened to that flow of teachers. I really don't know and I haven't spoken to anyone who does. But so that's definitely an area we, we should look into because it could be part, you know, a big part of this teacher shortage, um, at least for this particular class of teachers. So I think that's a, that's a great idea. And of course, um, yeah, I think the, I mean, here in Texas they've been pretty aggressive about trying to address teacher shortages. I don't know if they're going uh, far enough or what needs to be done, um, but it's a huge issue, like you said. I mean, the educational attainment, you know, for labor economists, it's all about skills and educational attainment is what leads to productivity growth, which is the holy grail of economics. That is what will grow our standard of living. And uh, so, you know, the, the correlation between education and productivity growth um, and a higher standard of living, I mean, it's undeniable. And so it's absolutely, you know, the most fundamental institution in our society is, is schools. Thank you. So now I'll take our last question from the dean of, uh, of my college. So I don't want to miss this one. <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> if you like, I'd like to return to the discussion of the observation that there has 
a meaningful decline in the participation of women in the labor force. Uh, and here, here's the reasoning that I'd like to get your perspective on. Uh, when, when the pandemic hit, we began to see a new discussion in periodicals, and that is the Great Resignation. Uh, then we began to observe in a few articles that the Great Resignation had differential effects upon men and women, with women being much more pronounced in terms of not returning to work. Okay. Let me ask a two-part question. Number one, in the calculation of employment figures, uh, are you able to discern whether or not the reason for not participating in the labor force is due to the great resignation versus what other factors are considered? And number two, do you think that the great resignation, particularly among females who are potentially eligible to work and participate in the labor force, will be long-lasting. There'll be a long tail to this because of whatever concerns, healthcare concerns or whatever. Well, what do you think? I think you can break down, um, you can break down, and we were doing that during the pandemic, the decline in the, in the labor force by, um, and looking at labor force exits, looking at those that were early retirements, um, those that were, um, not taking a job due to fear of COVID, um, those that were staying home to care for children because schools were closed. Uh, I think that, um, and we were able to parse those out. And uh, most of that has returned to normal uh, or pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so I think, I think we still have, uh, I think the early retirements right now may be the biggest factor suppressing the labor force, and so those, some of those people may, com may come back, um, you know, with the stock market down. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't laugh. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think this, um, the situation with um, the labor force, participation, labor force participation, especially of women when you compare to other countries, I think that's more of a longer run issue. It's not just a pandemic issue, because I think that started earlier. Um, and so, um, so that's a bigger conversation about the infrastructure around work in other countries compared to the lack of infrastructure around work here in the United States, which is things like government uh, subsidized childcare, which is one we talked about, public transportation. I mean, just things that facilitate people going to work, especially, especially mothers, I guess, and fathers. Um, so. Um, so I think that's a that's a that's a um, that's a bigger long run trend. So we have to look more at other things, uh, even outside the pandemic. Well, okay, great. So th thank you very much. <laughs> I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ennis for an excellent talk and a lively Q and A session. Um, we give our speakers. Uh, Tammy U Globe. So uh, this is our, our oh, thank, so you. thank you for coming and I talking love it. to us. And um, before everyone leaves, I'd like to thank everyone who makes this event possible. I'd like to thank IBC and Commerce Bank once again um, who, for their generous support for this lecture series. I, I would particularly like to thank Amy Palacios, the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade, who manages this event. It takes a lot of work to get all, to get everything organized to get to people here and to do all the work behind it. So I want to thank her. Um, I'd like to thank the staff in the School of Business, um, OIT, um, thank you OIT, and Event Services, and also the students from the um, Dean Student Advisory Council, Council who have helped us out with this event. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, everyone who came online and listened to this, and everybody who came into the audience. This is our first nice big audience after, after, after the COVID pandemic, so thank you all.